47 9. 47 9. Does it shock you that we're still getting score gummies with frequency? The 1,087th unique score in NFL history. All the tricks that the Lions brought out and the beatdowns. But news of the week in that crusher. Aiden Hutchinson out for the year. What it means in the beefy NFC North. Also, John Johns and the mind-expanding play of the weekend. Oregon's intentional 12-man penalty. Incredible coaching or rule flaw? Let's go around the horn. John. A division where everybody is four and two or better. Let's have a focus on the NFC North. Lions ripping the Cowboys to shreds. How many tackle eligible plays to Cam Dan Campbell throw it? And flea flickers. As systematic a beatdown as you can have, but the Aiden Hutchinson injury, broken tibia, an absolute crusher. No timetable for return, but that's a that's a half a year injury, so you know. It doesn't look good. Bears and Packers to four and two on Sunday. Caleb Williams, Jordan Love, both rolling. Chicago handling the Jaguars, Green Bay the Cardinals. You'd say that's what they're supposed to do, but doing it is the thing, people. And the Vikings, ah, they were on by. Remain undefeated. So this NFC North. How do you think the loss of Hutchinson changes the Lions and this great division around the horn? Tim Kalashaw. You know, Tony, obviously very tough for everyone to watch, no matter which side you're on, and I was there watching him a lot yesterday. He's he's in Dak's face on every play, gets injured on a sack, yeah. a player <laughs> just hitting the peak of his career. Now, what it means, Detroit's, uh, Detroit's number one in the NFL in offense, 30.2 points per game. They're going to keep scoring on everybody. And they had other linemen uh, in Dak's face yesterday. McNeil had a huge, huge day. But, but obviously, when you lose the guy that other teams have to focus on in your front seven – I think it brings them uh, – I think it brings Green Bay to Detroit's level, and I think th I have to put them both still. Injury to a team, then Aiden Hutchinson mm. being out for the year for the Lions. And the reason I say that, Tim mentioned the offense. They are never going to have a problem scoring. That's fine. It's defensively. He is the leader, came into Sunday as the leader for NFL Defensive Player of the Year. And one of the reasons is not just because of his ability to rush the passer. It is his ability – to make one of their biggest weaknesses something that's perhaps not as bad when he's out there on the football field is that secondary because when you're getting that pressure on the quarterback, it makes their job easier. So to me, I think this brings them down a little bit. I still think that I would put them at 1A with Minnesota or 1A and 1B with Minnesota to win this division, but there's no question that this is the biggest possible injury that you could see in this division. Ooh. Kevin Blackstone, is that how you see it? Yeah, I would have to agree with that. I mean, I think that the the big difference is going to be obviously with the pass rush. This guy's leading the league in, in sacks and hurries and pressures, and he's just been incredible all year, and that makes it easier on the backside when it comes to covering guys. What impact will that have on the offense? You may not have time of possession as great. You may not have as many possessions as you once had. And so maybe your scoring will dip just a little mm. bit under that 30 points per game. But does that mean that this is still not a playoff team? Absolutely not. I think the, I think the Lions may have been the strongest of this quartet uh, in the North um, with Hutchinson. And so now I don't think they're going to slip much, uh, much further behind that. A real test coming up when they get up against the and Vikings. that, of course, is this upcoming weekend. Pablo Torre, before we get there, what does this Hutchinson injury mean to the team and division? Yeah, the division, just for context here, it's not just in the conference. It's the NFL. All four teams in the NFC North have a better point differential than every other team in the league right now. Yeah, right. And so when you're talking about, that. okay, who gets squeezed out of this, if the margins are going to be tight like that, it is catastrophic. As Now, look. Harry's pointing out, okay, is there a, this is a different game, right? What is more catastrophic than looting Aiden, Aiden Hutchinson? I don't know if Jordan Love gets knocked out for the Packers. I, a different conversation, but the point is taken. I think that it's really, really problematic for this team to lose this Ooh. guy. I do think, uh -oh. though. Oh, okay. Cliche word. Think, You're though, bad. I do think, though, they're a playoff team still in spite of, you know. Of course. Everything of course. Happened. One more team to throw into this that hasn't been at the, the touch of the lips this so far. The Chicago Bears, Caleb Williams, four touchdowns, back-to-back -to -back weeks, maestro performances. Harry, is the Caleb Williams star breakout upon us? 
Yes, Tony, we talked about how this was a unique situation for our number one pick. He was put in a situation where he was going to be able to grow, and you're seeing not just the growth, but the opportunity to grow. And I say opportunity to grow because, one, this defense has allowed 21 points or less their last 12 games. You're not asking Caleb Williams to be the best player out there on the football field. You are asking him to get better as the season goes along, which he has. In the first three games, he threw two touchdowns, had four interceptions. Since then, he has had seven touchdowns, one interception. Have they been against teams that are perhaps not the best? Yeah, sure, that's fine. You still have to go out there and make the plays, and he looked like a great player on Sunday against a team that is not very good. So I think, like, right now, this is going exactly the way Pablo, the you're reacting in a way that makes me think you think the opposition is part of this. Please, go ahead. I'm, I'm just looking at Harry's suit and tie, and he has a very political aspect to him when he says, are these teams maybe not the best? <laughs> he beat the Panthers and the Jaguars. Okay. You're hitting pause? Those are the two teams we're talking about. And look, I, I, I think that what's fair to say is that Caleb Williams and the Bears, the offense is doing what we had predicted largely for these, for these Bears, right? Be better in terms of a rookie surrounded by support than any other equivalent scenario. But I need to see more in terms of who they're playing. Those are broad strokes. Tim, anything specifically you're seeing from Caleb Williams? Yeah, well, I was going to say we didn't really downgrade Jaden Daniels when the commanders were beating up on mm -hmm. bad teams. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can do it here when, okay. when Caleb Okay, KB, do you want to add anything on Caleb Williams? Well, I'm just going to say this is also about the ghost of Chicago Bears quarterbacks, right? I mean, that's what people thought he was falling into. Give him a chance to perform, and now you're seeing <laughs> that. Bad teams, who cares? It's like a preseason for him. He's getting better every week. 47-9. That's the worst loss in Dallas in the Jerry Jones era. Jerry somehow was available for comment afterwards. Hmm. Oh, I haven't even uh, considered that. I'm not considering that. Just so you're clear, I'm but, not considering it. But you've done it no, once I, before. I wouldn't be a hypothetical in that matter. Do you think I'm an idiot? Tim, floor is yours, please. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this floor, Tony. We've been doing this show to only 22 years. Obviously, we haven't done it long enough for the Cowboys to get to an NFC Championship <laughs> game. Uh, this this show would have to be have a much longer history than that. Uh, this is this is as bad as it gets for a team that was in the playoffs. The previous year, the three home games in the first half, the opponents have scored 11 touchdowns. Cowboys have scored one. They get blown out in every home game so quickly. And even with the injuries they have on defense, the tackling is so bad. Uh, everybody saw Diggs yesterday just waving runners past him because he's all about interceptions. Uh, it, it's just it's the worst atmosphere you can create. When you, you pay the prominent players, you don't pay the coaches or you don't extend them. Everybody knows they're on one-year deals. Uh, the fact that they can't get a hold of this team and you got 53 players going 53 directions, it's really not a surprise. Mm. But you think the coaching is an issue in that they weren't signed long-term before the season? Or do you think the coaching is an issue because they're not getting the job done and being able to, to work with these players? That's, that's not to let the coaches off the hook. They, they have... Zimmer has had some horrible game plans. They tried to stop the Lions' run with their front seven yesterday. That was a disaster waiting to happen. McCarthy still thinks this team has a running game. He's still feeding Zeke the ball. Eight carries yesterday, more than Dowdle got. Uh, they, they do some idiotic things, but they were put in a precarious situation. Pablo, you heard Jerry Jones say, uh, hypotheticals, I'm not even taking that into consideration right now. Do you believe there is any fix that this team can do right now? Uh, not at the moment, right? Not at the moment, Tony. Look, we know what the Cowboys are. They're a team built around stars and the star. And I didn't realize until this game that it was the sun, actually, that they were talking about as the star in question. <laughs> all of it feels, yeah. all of it feels insane to me. And also, by the way, just the notion that at some point the Lions were so good and so comfortable that the Cowboys were incidental. The Lions were trying to prove a point, of course, about the game they had lost. Remember about yeah. ineligible yeah. receivers and all of that? Like <laughs> flea flickers and just offensive linemen downfield. Like the Cowboys were just in the way <laughs> on the way to a larger point, which is just insulting on another It level. may be the same with, with all of us. They're in the way of us trying to do a lot of other topics on the show. Kevin Black is though, please. 
You're exactly okay. right. We're talking about the Cowboys as disastrous as season has been and not talking enough about the rest of the league. But this is what happens when you look at the Cowboys and you look at Jerry Jones and you look at the fact that, oh, defensive, you want to talk about the coaches? They're here in Washington now. And Dan Quinn and his assistant, Joe Witt, and doing as best a job as they can with this team and helping it turn around. And then you look at all the money invested in the in the, in the the spots that they have. On top of that, they got the, they got the injury problem and they are just in total disarray. Right. Well, that being said, then, and we can look down at their uh, uh, schedule over the next month. It's a tough schedule. It may get worse than this, as odd as that is to say after 47-9. For the moment, that team's name is a bad phrase on this network. All right, we're going to move on from here. Taking a break. Buy yourself that. Thank you. Thank you. That's deserved. Um, 30, Commanders 23, game of the week, and Baltimore delivers. Came into this game with the best rushing offense in the league in 40 years. Does this look like a different Baltimore team? KB, take away from that or maybe Washington perspective. Well, it certainly looks good for the Ravens to have added Henry to their roster. Um, makes things so much easier for them. But I'm looking at this through burgundy and gold colored glasses, of course. And what I saw was Jaden Daniels having to go up against the toughest competition he has all year and did quite well. I mean, they came within a possession, a touchdown of, of, uh, of tying this ball game. And he was a solid he was a solid performer. So this is no longer a playoff pretender here. It's a playoff contender. But we know that the Ravens are still Super Bowl allows you after this game. Yeah, I'm buying that the Ravens are the best team in the NFL and that Derrick Henry is the best acquisition any team made during the offseason. On 63% of his runs, this box was stacked against him, and it didn't matter. On 24 carries, 132 yards, two touchdowns, best player out on the field. And I still say Jaden Daniels going to be the best quarterback from this rookie class. The poise that he showed in his two touchdown passes looked like some veteran-type stuff. So I think Washington is All right, but your headline really was best team in the NFL, to... Baltimore, over, of course, everybody else, including Kansas City, who they lost to in week one. Tim Kalisha, yeah. what do you buy? What do you sell from Harry there? Yeah, the only problem the only problem with what Harry said is that Baltimore's going to look back at those first two games that they lost when they didn't use Henry a lot, and that may end up being why they're playing the Chiefs in Kansas City in January. Mm -hmm. uh, but but this was a nice win for them. Dominant game despite the seven points. Pablo Torre. Yeah, remember, one of the Ravens' weaknesses was what are they doing in the fourth quarter, choking away leads, losing games, and Derrick Henry being your closer, right? It's not just in this game that he's facing stacked boxes. He faced them about every four in ten downs, and he is first in the fourth quarter overtime in yards per rush, EPA per rush, uh, yards over expected, all of those numbers. He is the meat tenderizer that is taking KB's glasses and stomping them and shattering them. That is what has been whoa, happening whoa. when you played Derek Kemper. Beat tenderizer, <laughs> but then stomping glasses, you were in between two different expressions. All right. College, buy or sell two, Oregon 32, Ohio State 31. Two things Oregon did here. The onside kick blasted off the first man. Been asking for this for the entire 21 years of the show. It works, people. And then end of game. Strategy. Dan Lanning's move here with the game on the line. It seems like he took an intentional 12-man penalty. This is what everybody thinks. It's mind expanding. Giving up five yards, but taking off four seconds that the play was used to run. So there is no option to put the time back on the clock for the penalty. The yardage gained for the penalty, not enough for field goal range. So Ohio State is in a razor-thin margin here. Had to be quick. They get a play. They run into field goal range, but all the time is taken up and that's the ball game. Harold, Harry, is this incredible coaching to take a penalty on here or a rule flaw? Uh, I think it's both. I think Dan Lanning is a much more intelligent coach than people like to give him credit for. I think they don't like sometimes the way that he calls the game. Mind you, a lot of the things that he was criticized for last year in the Washington game won them this game mm -hmm. on Saturday. But I do think that it was probably intentional. He's a very smart coach, and I think if he, uh, if more people agreed with how he called games, we would be we would see more people calling him a genius today than wondering if he actually did this on purpose or not. Tim Kalisha. Tom Coughlin did a similar thing against the Patriots in a Super Bowl. Uh, years ago, the second Giants Patriots Super Bowl. It's definitely a rule flaw, though. It, it, it's something you, if you're going to take the penalty, they ought to be able to put the four seconds back on the Obligatory. clock. 
Yeah, this is a violation of the spirit of the law by using its letter. And we've seen Belichick do something similar in the NFL. Mike Vrabel, remember, copied Belichick. Penalties to kill clock. And the result there, by the way, Tony, was the NFL closed the loophole. This is how rules changes are made. People are too smart, and they realize, oh, we should have covered yeah, that one. Black stone. This is called game management, clock management. That's what we always talk about. He saw the opportunity, he took it, it was absolutely brilliant. If the rule is there and you can use it or abuse it, go right ahead and do it. Thank goodness. Fire Cell 3, the changes in the top five in college. Oregon up to two after that big win. And Penn State making a move to three after their raucous comeback win at USC. Look at that play. Look at that catch. That also a play of the week. Texas, of course, sitting at one after pantsing Oklahoma. Harry, biggest outcome of the weekend. Yeah, I think we all kind of knew Texas was going to run Oklahoma in this game. To me, this is absolutely Oregon's win over Ohio State. You're going into the Big Ten. Ohio State has been the standard, not just of that conference, except for the last couple of years, Michigan. I hear you. Don't worry about it. Uh, but has been one of the undeniable forces of college football to go in and win that football game and to establish yourself as now the power of that particular conference. I don't think that there could be a bigger win this Jim weekend. In I'm going to go with Oregon, too, but specifically because the NIL uh, rules that allow Oregon to have Dylan Gabriel this year and Oklahoma to play Texas uh, with a freshman quarterback who clearly wasn't ready for that game. They needed Dylan Gabriel back. He threw for 340 against Ohio State. Yeah, Tone, we're dealing with an expanded playoff field this year. I want to expand the answers to this question. Can I take Alabama here? Just narrowly surviving South Carolina by two? They're a playoff team unless they keep on doing stuff like this after losing to Vanderbilt. Good points raised by everybody, but that's the team that really opened my eyes. Oh, they might actually be this bad. Is it KB? Penn State, because their fans would ex have expected James Franklin to lose this particular yeah. game. And they were losing this particular yeah. game by two touchdowns, and somehow miraculously. Look at it again. Have you ever seen a snapper catch a touchdown pass before? <laughs> it is. Uh, we were no. talking about coaching, Brilliant. and uh, what an incredible call that is. And since none of you said it, I'll support the troops. Army and Navy, both <laughs> in the top 25. Yes, that's awesome. Harry Lowell Jr., Pablo Torre, thanks for your time. Kyle Shaw, Blackstone Showdown, next. Oh, all right. Eagles 20, Browns 16 in Philadelphia. Nick Sirianni had a moment with a fan or fans when the win became uh, locked in. Couldn't see if it was a Browns fan or an Eagles fan, but this was a home game. There were boos earlier, so here he is, John with Johns, I guess. Eagles 3-2, and two, and here's Sirianni at the podium. Family plan after the game. Tim, is Sirianni allowed to jaw with a fan after a win? Tony, I, I think in a lot of cities this would really be damaging for a head coach. But given that it's Eagles fans and people know, even in Philadelphia, what they're like, I think they're going to allow him a little leeway hmm. here. KB? No, absolutely not. I mean, come on, be a professional football coach no matter where you are. If I'm the owner, I'm saying, yo, you just deal with the team. We'll deal with the fans, all right? I kind of dig it. Kids at the podium, uh, I think we all know what, what's in play there. You're trying to solve for the questions, but I kind of dig John with fans, all right? Max Crosby, I love Mike Caldwell. It was a love push. That's what Max said. Cameras made it look like he was throwing him at the club, Crosby said. Kevin, is that a love push or thrown at the club? Oh, no, that's absolutely being thrown out the club. And I'm surprised that if you're at a real club, that's the beginning of a fight. I'm surprised that didn't happen. You can't do that to your coach. Come on, stop. Timmy? KB needs to update his references. This has been a problem for a while now, Tony. We see this all the time with players. They give each other, instead of doing the high five, instead of jumping into each other, they give them the shove. Uh -huh. It's love. Uh -huh. It's all love. I agree with you, that's Tim. Mike although Tomlin. Previously, it didn't really work for Aaron Rodgers and Robert Sala, right? Uh, <laughs> boy, <laughs> goes to stone. Showdown three, Liberty 80, Link 66 to even the series. Again, a huge double-digit lead disappeared. New York almost completely caved in, but then this three here from Fevich on a breakaway. Listen to the pop. Into the backcourt. Fevich has it. Three on one. Fevich a three. You got it! Tim, with the win, did the Liberty settle the ship? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, they, they had trouble with Minnesota. Couldn't beat them during the season. Again, Minnesota comes fighting back. That's like a five or six point play there off the foot. Minnesota's very much alive. Blackstone? 
I'm just saying that the Lynx are 16 and 4 at home this year, just like the Liberty were at home. But I had the Liberty winning this thing and winning it by the margin, margin that they did. I think the Liberty has got this mm -hmm. in their bill. Kevin Blackstone, 30 seconds of FaceTime. I just want to let you know Friday night at Maryland's football stadium, I was there. I work there but I was there to root for the other team. Northwestern, why? Because I went there. Do not get it confused. People ask me all the time, do you root for your alma mater or your employer? You always root for the alma mater because if not for the alma mater, you might not have an employer. And that's what I did. Way to go, Purple. Love that big victory. Sorry about that, Locks. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So no, don't get it confused? Okay, not confused. Don't get it confused. Loyal. I always root for my panel over everybody. Jay Adonde, you made the Basketball Hall of Fame. Well, you know, of course you know this. You're back here on Thursday.